George Bowne, because it was his 250th birthday in February. And I think George Bowne really could be, if you can excuse the term, called the godfather of the secular society. Because a lot of the founders of the secular society knew George Bowne, were inspired by, by him. But he had a very long and interesting life. And uh, uh, I hope this is going to work. Yes, at the age of 22, that was in 1792, um, George Bowne was working for this man, Richard Phillips, who was uh, not only a sort of scientist, a uh, mathematician, teacher of maths, um, but he was also dealt in canal shares and various sort of things like that. And he, he had a shop on the corner of uh, Horsefair, it's not Horsefair, yeah, Humston Gate and Gallantry Gate, where Burton's used to be. And in that shop he sold all sorts of pamphlets. And of course, uh, one of the pamphlets he sold was the Rights of Man, for which he was arrested and sent to prison for 18 months in Leicester Prison. And one of his jailer, of course, was the well-known Daniel Lambert, who ensured that he was held in pretty miserable circumstances. Now, the reason why we celebrate Daniel Lambert, I do not know, because he, he punished this particular radical. George Bowne himself... Um, became the secretary of the Corresponding Society and he signed a, a, a manifesto which wanted universal suffrage in 1792, uh, support of the French Revolution, so a very progressive figure. Bound himself was arrested but managed to avoid prison for any great length of time. Um, with Phillips, he'd helped set up a, a newspaper in Leicester called the Leicester Herald. Um, which was published even though Phillips was held in prison, and I think Bowne must have been the go-between to enable the newspaper to be published. Um, and when Phillips got out of prison, his shop burnt down, and he departed for London, where he had a quite a successful political career, and Bowne went off to Nottingham. And he came back in 1813, and he was asked to uh, be editor of the Leicester Chronicle, which you see there, not a, not a lot of pictures in the paper of 1830. And the reason why he was asked was because of the Tory press at that time. If you think the, the Sun and the Daily Mail and the Express are pretty vile, you haven't read the Tory press of the early 1900s because they were pretty, they were pretty, uh, yeah, 1800s, they were pretty awful. And it, Baum was engaged to the editor of this paper because he could be equally vituperous and libelous. And uh, he, he was editor for a couple of years until he so, I think, disappointed the owners of the Leicester Chronicle. They felt that it was impossible to put their newspaper in front of their wives and children. And uh, it was very illiberal, the kind of language that he used. So uh, Bowne lost his job and then uh, was forced to sell uh, lottery tickets. And then he set up a school in Charles Street, which I'll come back to in, in due course. But in 1830... He had, um, oops. Uh, after, yeah, he had a job running the, the, being an accountant to the coaches that went from the Bell Hotel down to London. That was one of his, one of his jobs, because I've done all that. And in 1830 and 1831, he became secretary of the Reform Association, which was represented a lot of the big manufacturers in, in Leicester who were radicals, who wanted an extension of the franchise. And there was a big movement to try and, you know, to try and extend the franchise, which resulted in the 1831 uh, uh, Act. But of course, it also resulted in the overthrow of the old Tory corrupt corporation in Leicester in 1835. And this little picture, which was produced by in, in a book published by the Secretary of the Society in 1851, shows the feasting, because the mayor's feasts were a symbol of all that was corrupt with the Leicester Corporation, and it says, down with feasting, down with the mayor's feast. So Bowne had, you know, was quite respected by the sort of uh, radical manufacturers in, 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 in Leicester, and uh, he then went on and got a job um, with the council itself as its accountant. And the Leicester Journal said, in appointing this producer of scurrilous handbills, liberalism and atheism, he's been rewarded. And Bound replied, 
I've had nearly 47 years of labouring to deserve and obtain the maledictions of, despicable, of the despicable factions which these co-journalists are the organs. I feel their long silence as a reproach that I have been indolent. I mean, you get a, a, a measure of Brown's uh, writing style. It was firmly rooted in the 1790s, even, even right down to the 1850s. But, I mean, um, but uh, at the time he was appointed uh, the council as a council, he was also working for the Mechanics Institute, which at that time was in what was called the New Hall. You know it as the old uh, uh, Central Library. And he ran classes in there teaching English grammar, I think astronomy, and one or two, one or two other things. But at the end of the 1830s, in 1838, um, he parted company with the Mechanics Institute. Uh, I don't know whether he was sacked or resigned, but the issue was his approach to teaching the Bible. And I suspect he'd also imported... Uh, Robert Allen's uh, New Moral World and circulated it amongst his students. But anyway, as you can see, the, the members of those classes which have been suspended against whom the doors of the classrooms have on some false, frivolous and despotic pretense been lately locked, are now informed that by the indulgence of the tenants of the commercial rooms, regular accommodations provide... So he moved his class from the Mechanics Institute to the newly opened Social Institution in Leicester, which was... Uh, run on these premises by the branch of the local Owenites. And it was here that the founders of the Secular Society heard George Bowne lecture. And uh, these uh, rooms hold, held the Owenite branch for you know, quite, a, quite a few years until basically the Owenites became financially bankrupt and could no longer afford the rent, I, I, I guess. So uh, I don't know how long his classes uh, continued there because he got another job. And um, this is the advert that was placed in the paper for the social institution and all its classes that it, that it ran. And this, the social institution was the ancestor of this hall. You, you know, people like Josiah Jimson, who you see up there, went to, went to classes there. And I, I think it was their intention to have something like the social institution and call it a secular hall uh, all those years later. In 1840, Bowne became editor of the Chartist newspaper in Leicester, the Midland County's Illuminator, it was called. And uh, he did that for a, uh, a few years until he was, uh, uh, his successor was Thomas Cooper, who, who ran it until he was sent to prison in, I think, 1842. Sorry about this. But his next job was as inspector of nuisances. And the Inspector of Nuisances was regarded widely in the 1830s as a bit of a sinecure, but Bound decided to make something of the job. And basically what the job was, an Inspector of Nuisances, was to go around and find what nuisances there were. And he decided to turn it into public health. He tried to survey Leicester uh, of public health. And I'll just read you a little uh, snippet of, one of, of, of his view of... Um, Leicester at that time. He said, my powers are too limited to affect all I could wish. Now this relates to toilet twin. The state of the privies has now become serious. They are crying grievance. From the difficulty of getting them emptied, their liquid contents filter through the walls, drain down yards, in contact with the wells, till many parts of the town the water is unfit for any purpose. Entire districts of the town are little better than vast reeking dung heaps. All these congregated evils form an a orgiant accumulation of pestiferous matter which requires a Herculean power to cleanse them away. And he also cited the prevalence of pig styes and rotting matter right, left and centre. And what Bowne did was to say that what was required was a, a medical authority to the job he did, and he appointed a Mr. Buck, who became Leicester's medical officer of health. And this was prior to the uh, 1848, I think, yes, Public Health Act, which enabled local authorities to have a medical officer of health. So Leicester was the first town in the country to have a medical officer of health, and that was down to Bounds Initiative. So I think he had quite a important and interesting thing that he did. 
He retired in 1849, just after he published a book, um, or sorry, a pamphlet, uh, which was about Chartism. And the, the pamphlet was called Physical Force, an address to all classes of reformers, but especially to those who are unjustly excluded from the franchise. And which he sort of rather long-windedly sort of um, argued that physical force should be held in reserve if moral force was not uh, successful in gaining people the vote. I'm, what, what Bowne said in a, in a speech in 1850-something or other, he said, you know, people's right to have a vote, and he'd never voted in his life, shouldn't be dependent on how many windows they've got in their house, how many bricks they've got, or how much money they've got in the bank. And he, he, made, he made that point. And he ended up in Trinity Hospital. And he, he got into trouble because uh, he refused to go to the church services, as you can see. There's a nice picture of Trinity Hospital. But when he died, the, the, the controversy surrounding him didn't die too, because the friends of George Bowne decided to collect money for a monument to him, and, which is, uh, and they were quite successful. And you can see here, there's a list of the people that contributed money, and amongst them were the officers of the First Secular Society of 1852. So they, they all contributed money to build a memorial. So I would guess that George Bowne must have been a member of the First Secular Society. We have no membership records, but given his reputation and given his involvement with radical causes, I think it's pretty, pretty certain that he was. And the monument itself, which still exists, is nine foot high, made from a single pillar of the hardest sandstone, and was inscribed in 1859 with the words, here lies one who never feared the face of man. And one of the letters which was sent to the paper about this monument says, um, uh, Never, I believe, and I am speaking from considerable acquaintance with Mr. Bowne in various ways, did any man in Leicester do more to disseminate the principles of infidelity, that's uh, an infidel, infidelity amongst a class of young men, young men over whom his position in times gone by gave him a powerful influence. Mr. Bowne was never ashamed of this. Indeed, his whole life, from the period of his teaching at the school, and my brother was withdrawn from him in consequence of his repudiation of the Bible, to his residence in the Trinity Hospital, whose rules he constantly defied are one of continuous protests against the fundamental truths of Christianity. Are we then to understand that the maintenance and propagation of principles such as these entitle a man to the respect and esteem evinced by the erection of a monument. So there are a lot of people who said, well, we should not have a monument to this now, but here it is in uh, Wilford Road Cemetery. Unfortunately, as you can see, the inscription has fallen off the front of it. And I would very much like, since it's, two, it's 250th anniversary, for us as a secular society, mm -hmm to have it put back on oh, yeah. and try and commemorate, you know, the, the various act, activities of this man. And this photograph is actually taken from the grave of the uh, Chartist leader, John Markham, who they were both known one another, who, but Markham wasn't a, uh, a secularist. It's, uh, it's interesting that they lie together, but the you know, graves have fallen into disrepair, and I, I, think we should, I think we should remember them. I think the you know, it could look something like like that. That's what they could put on there. Just like to finish with a little quote um, from a, a letter he wrote to the papers in 1848 when he was uh, inspector of nuisances. It is officially announced that the Asiatic cholera is approaching this country from the same quarter and the same route which preceded its formal fatal visit. This is appalling intelligence. An enemy so formidable is not to be treated with contempt or indifference, but ought to be compacted with weapons of consummate strength and efficiency. As conservator of public health in this town, I feel induced to urge fellow townsmen to meet to the immediate application of all the ordinary preventative measures which are individually in our power. 
every death that may ensue from any neglect of preventative means is in fact at least moral manslaughter. I need not give minute details of what may be called the ordinary means of preventing pestilence. They are comprised generally in rigid attention to the breathing of the purest air, exercise, temperance, cleanliness, personal and domestic, with a due regard to the quantity of food, animal and vegetable, and a sufficient supply of clothing. He also wanted the council to spend £500 on scattering lime on the streets and watering it because it was believed at that time that the gas given off would uh, disinfect the miasma because it was believed at that time diseases were passed not through uh, viruses and germs but by through the air we breathe. And it's not, not, the science wasn't right. But, I mean, he at least uh, was involved in pestilence prevention in Leicester all those years ago. Thank you.